based on the roles, the characters are building the horror and building the mystery and the solution to the mystery. I just brought the book and dropped the book down on the table and people flip through and they're like, we're in. And I got more out of the Boston <laughs> book than I think I did this month long course. <laughs> it's a great game for newer game masters and, you know, old farts like me to, because it, it, it really tries to maintain a structure. In this video, we're talking about Vason, the Nordic horror role-playing game by Free League Publishing. Next on How to RPG. So, Vason, Vason. I think it's more like Vason. Uh, listening to the author, he varies between straight up Vason. So there's like a little hitch in the Vason. And he'll also say Vason when he's talking to people in the UK, because people in the UK all seem to say Vason. So... Take your pick. Released by the Swedish company Free League Publishing, Vasen is a gothic horror role-playing game set in the mythic north, an alternate 19th century version of Scandinavia. The game is based on the work of Swedish illustrator and author Johan Ergkrans and uses an adapted version of the award-winning Year Zero engine. Free League has certainly won their fair share of awards over the years. And the gold any for best cover art goes to... And the gold any for best interior art goes to... Best monster adversary. Gold any for best interior art. The gold any for best adventure. The gold any for best setting goes to... Vason. 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 Mythic Britain and Ireland. Phil McClory, a friend, friend patron of the show, and he's in my game group said, you know what, you should do a video on Vason. And I said, that's a good idea. The only thing is, I've never run it or played it. So I had to get some people that actually have run it and played it. And, well, it just so happens that I game every other week with three players that have run or played it quite a bit more extensively than I have. Early days, like right after it came out, I ran a <clears throat> probably a three or four part, uh, like an extended one shot, like one mystery worth for the game group I was running at the time. I ran a, about a 15, 18 part, you know, campaign. And I've, I've played it a couple times too. I ran a, a 40 session Vossen campaign. Now, just to preface that our sessions are pretty short They're Yeah. Four zero. Um, but our sessions are pretty short. Uh, they're like an hour and a half to two hours. And uh, so we ran a total of six mysteries, uh, over the course of the campaign. And the third one, the drowned man, I published to drive through RPG. The, you know, in terms of an elevator pitch, um, you know, it's, it's a year zero engine game. So if you like free league games, it has that sort of those mechanics and that quality kind of throughout. But it, I, I always approach Vaisen specifically from like the setting type of thing. So quasi-historical 19th century i think uh the author describes it as cozy horror so it's not like delta green it's not super gory and bloody but it's also dark it's not a kids game like this is not a lightweight game There's the uh the subject matter specifically involves like a lot of poverty abuse prostitution drug use all that stuff is sort of threaded all throughout uh throughout the setting but the the, the real pitch for me gets down to there's a great premise where there is a society at the heart of things of either monster hunters or monster or uh, mystery chasers, basically people who are sighted and who can see the unnatural, the Vaison in the game. And they travel all over what um, the book calls the mythic north, um, rooting out uh, Vaison that are in conflict with humans, resolving situations, sometimes killing the creatures are dispelling the creatures. Sometimes it's actually comes down on the side of that. The humans are the ones who are in the wrong. It's very much a shades of gray kind of game. I'll say this in the opening pages, there are some really good like touch points that the GM can use to summarize when they're pitching to their game. The first like chapter gets into that in, in pretty good detail. It's in an intimate setting. It, it, this isn't cosmic horror. This is the village cannery has got a, has got a problem and people are going to starve. A lot of the mysteries, you know, they rotate around miscommunication, fear of change, you know, the strangely the economy, I know that sounds weird, but there's a lot of like things that are just getting out of whack and, um, and, and people are suffering. 
Um, there's lots of loss and loneliness. Here's the other thing that like sold this dead to rights. The freaking art. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not kidding, man. I, I just brought the book and dropped the book down on the table and people flip through and they're like, we're in. If people like real folklore, not, you know, not not Cinderella folklore, but like, you know, the Brothers Grimm, you know, there's lots of like uh, people getting their eyes pecked out by birds and <laughs> and people being rolled down a hill and barrels full of nails. I mean, that's it's really pretty dark. So, um, you yeah, know, they, they were kind of in. Role-playing gamers love to look at other role-playing games, sometimes exploring different genre and Every once in a while, somebody make make a specific comparison with another popular horror-based role-playing game. I don't think it plays anything like Call of Cthulhu in terms of tone. No, no, no I don't think so at all. The characters can certainly get caught in increasingly difficult situations. You know, that's the that's the kind of mythology whatever that's grown up around call of cthulhu that it's always a death spiral and i mean there's there's some truth to that i guess but um that's that's really not the case in this game when it comes to the mythos those are unknowable uh, you can't understand those horrors and that's i guess the the reason why the impetus why you will eventually go insane the more you understand them the more it will drive you to madness you just you can't wrap your head around them they are so far removed from humanity that's the premise of call of cthulhu with with vasan uh these things are knowable they are understandable they can be solved they can be communicated with uh a lot of their desires although have some kind of fake complexity to them they are relatable if you don't understand them you that's that's when you can't make progress in this game like you can't just shoot them you can't just push them off a cliff or whatever you've got to understand like why are they upset what you know what, what are they rooted in uh, who do they have a grievance with so it's completely different from the you read a book and now you're insane type of you know and and i love call of cthulhu and delta green all all the mythos stuff yeah. but this this does play very differently the fight against vaisen your mission is to protect humanity from vaisen but the world is not black and white the vaisen you encounter are often victims of other vaisen or of human activities. So you'll have to take a stand and do what is right, whatever that may be. I think the game uh, like incredibly strongly knows what it's about. I also think it opens the gates and the players come out and now you can go freaking anywhere and do anything. I will say this, the voice in the book, so the author's voice throughout the book, he clearly has sympathy for the Vaison and for the way things used to be. Your players could go full in for depending on which adventures you play and how the GM paints the picture, they could totally go and support the VSN most of the time. But the, the GM needs to bear in mind, like not every adventure is because a human has done something stupid. Sometimes one VSN affects another. Some of them are downright horrible. They're like people. Some are okay. Some are nasty. And you, you, just, right. you just have to get rid of them somehow. So it's this wide ranging thing. And it kind of it evolves depending on what adventures you play, depending on what happens in those adventures. Some of you may not be wholly unfamiliar with the Year Zero engine mechanics. For those of you that haven't delved into the Free League catalog, there's a couple versions, kind of. So in Twilight 2000 and Blade Runner, you typically have a die type for each ability. With the Tales from the Loop, Forbidden Lands, Alien, and Vaisen, they all use a D6 dice pool. For example, there's four attributes, physique, precision, logic, and empathy. And then there are 12 different skills, each one tied to one of those abilities. So for example, for every point in skill and every point in a corresponding attribute allows you to add one D6 to your dice pool. You roll that dice pool and every six on the roll is a success. If you do not succeed on the first roll, you can opt to push your roll. And in many of these D6 based year zero engine games, that push differs on what happens to your character. 
if you decide to push, then you have decided to take a condition. You know what's going to, you know, it's going to, you're going to have a cost for, for taking the risk for pushing. Because sometimes it's really important to succeed. You know, you, you could be like one away from broken and decide, I know that I'm going to be, you know, on the ground after this, but effort, I've got to do it. You know, and that's, that's a heroic choice. I would say, generally speaking, Sean, this is where there's like nuance that maybe not everybody appreciates when they read a game versus the other YZE games. Like Forbidden Lands, when you're pushing, Forbidden Lands has this horrendous death spiral you can get into, right? But it also has, on the heroic side, you can push and nothing bad happens to you. You just succeed like crazy. This game, Tales and Things from the Flood are all saying, if you're pushing, bad shit's going down. You are ticking a box in your stress track, whether it's physical or mental in this game. So you have to be really judicious about when you're going to do that. Uh, and right. what I love about it, uh, you know, I've, I've played a lot of games of metacurrency over the years, and I've settled on really liking metacurrency like this. It's essentially meta, metacurrency, not quite the same, but that doesn't give you a sure thing. Like instead of like a fate point that gives you plus two, you, all you're getting here is a chance to, re, to to roll again. And the four of us know how dramatic it can be when you're when you're pushing and rolling again. Right. And you may still end up with nothing, even though you pushed, you may still get nothing, which I love. The I love the risk in that role. Players have to be cool with like failure. They have to they have to understand how it can lead to like awesome outcomes for the story, for their character, for the other characters who now have to step in and help them. It's it's not about like, opto- how do I get the highest modifier for my role uh, type of thing? Like, why would I ever do that? It's risky. It's meant to be risky. <laughs> and in this case, you're not meant to risk it on trivial roles. Save it for when it means something. Right? Normally, I would always be just cool with a single success, but the book does describe. Yeah. And so every once in a while, I would say, okay, this is what you're asking for is going to be pretty hard. I'm going to need two successes. So I would always give them the heads up um, when they were making the roles, what, they, what was going to be required of them. You know, the dice shouldn't be in your hands unless unless there things are really questionable and um and it and some element of excitement is involved. For this game and Tales and all of all of uh, Hins's games, you are saying difficulty one, two, three, those are the successes that you need, right? It's which is hard. Which is brutal. But the cool ass part that the other YZE games don't do, because they don't do difficulty the same way, you can trade forward successes. So if Wayne rolls three successes, he can give one of them to Phil if it's a yeah. difficulty two. So it's very group oriented. It's I, I, that came from Tales, where the kids like have to do this. They they're all rolling and they're like trading dice around kind of thing. And I've even seen. I remember some of the early actual plays for Tales from a Loop. People were actually like taking the six and giving it to each other, like this very physical. Like here's a success yeah. because my kid did so well at the. And this game has that, which I think is pretty badass. It's a it's a cool way of doing it. You, you also have a memento, and it it really should be part of like your your character's backstory, and um, and that does have a mechanical benefit because you can use it to heal a condition. Physical conditions are kind of difficult to heal. The mental conditions, you're. you're Oftentimes, the mentos were used to heal those conditions up, but also the other characters, they could have a like a role playing session and and try to inspire you. I was you know, just going to say, up. yeah, right to, you know, and and it should be a real like scene. You got to talk about something like I want to know why what she says or what he says to you actually helps after, you know, you've just saw the, you know, the Lindworm. This is not uh, this is not Cure Light Wounds roll 1d8. Yeah, right. For, forgive forgive my AD and D reference, but it's not that. You right. role play. It. Yeah. 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 On one hand, the game is really trad. Like there's nothing on your sheet that is will prevent that from happening, right? From a GM from locking a clue behind uh, a wall or whatever. It's also not tremulous. It's not Brindlewood Bay. These are not emergent horror stories where the Based on the roles, the characters are building the horror and building the mystery and the solution to the mystery. It is not that at all. But aside from like the core mechanics, which we've described, which are the four attributes, the skills, the talents, the D6 pool, successes, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. Put all that aside. Like that's the core of the game. But there is a there are a chapter or two chapters about the mysteries themselves. And, the, and those have like eight step frameworks in them that are very specific about establish what's at fault here, what happened, 
Uh, how do you get to the bottom of it? And there's actually one of the phases has a clock, but they are incredibly structured in terms of like both how the how the, mis- the mystery should unfold, but also the components of the mystery. So I would mm-hmm. actually say the game is loaded with excellent mechanics for that, but they're not like traditional mechanics where they interact directly with things on your sheet. You know, there's a column in the book when they're talking about skills, the idea of failing forward. So if if you as the GM feel like whatever they're trying to accomplish is essential to the game and they fail the role, then you have to think about a way of giving it to the player, but they're, ha- they're you know, consider a consequence to it. So maybe the Vossen now is aware that you're on to them That's and right. you might become a target, a more targeted or, uh, or the sheriff is worried about you now or whatever, right? Exactly. So you 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 create a complication that's going to throw a wrench into things for the players because you're basically throwing them a bone. Um, or you can go with like the Alexandrians three clue rule where it's like, okay, so they didn't get it here, but maybe where else can I put that? And I think that obviously works a little bit more if you're doing a, a, a homebrew scenario versus a, a written one. But I mean, that's just another way of getting around that. Don't lock it in one place. I mean, that's that just seems Stop. like... Yeah, that's d- thank yeah dumb. <laughs> yeah, I, I, the game, I mean, I believe the game actually says it the, cent- states, the central clues states. should not be locked behind skill rolls. I mean, the, I mean, let's say lock, but I, I think it just says they shouldn't be behind a skill roll. There's this awesome countdown to catastrophe piece, which is like a clock that ticks, and if the players, if the PCs aren't fast enough, worse and worse shit goes on, and it can end the adventure if they're not fast enough. I find the countdowns to be really good because they they suggest how to ramp things up at key moments to right. just increase the tension. Yeah, and they also do tend to help move the story forward. So if you feel things are kind of getting a little bit stale and you need to put a little juice into it, that's what that was. It, it, that's how I found them to be anyways. And uh, yeah, if you hit catastrophe, it's game over. It's just, you just pretty much got to get the hell out of there. Game over, man. It's game over. Right? Like the horrible things are happening. Villages are burning down. Major NPCs are being killed. The the Vossen are almost out of control. And you've, you've essentially failed at that point if you hit catastrophe. Think if every Call of Cthulhu scenario had this at the end. I mean those dead ends that people get into where they don't know if they're going the right way and they got a they got a dead end lead this steps in and takes care of that a really cool mechanic and it gives you because of that too it it gives you new avenues to explore like as this countdown hits boom this event occurs and it gives something for the players to key in on if they're kind of stuck or stalled in neutral the other thing too another mechanic i don't know if if players or gms necessarily will like it but at some point in the progression of the mystery if they have uncovered a certain number of clues, the players can ask to do what's called the learning test. And that's where they make a learning role. And I, I I forgot to look it up earlier today, but where I think then they make this role. And if they're successful and the more successes you get, the clues that they put together, you as the GM can confirm certain things to them or give them a little bit more information that they're, I guess, as player characters, maybe have put together collectively as a group. So this game has motivation, trauma, relationships, and dark secret. And like all the other YZE games, they're not really all that wired into anything mechanically. They're more like a connectivity piece set up at the beginning to like, in some cases, you can leverage it to get a better role. In some cases, uh, you'll be earning XP if you engage with it. But it's not like it's not as mechanical as as a skill or a talent. I'll put it that way. Like the relationships, guys, correct me if I'm wrong. You don't earn anything from from playing the relationship. You just establish how you look at the other PCs, and it gives you role playing grist for the mill, so you can kind of kind of dig into it. And the trauma is really important because the trauma is like what shitty thing happened to you that gave you the sight, and then resulted yeah. kind of in your motivation as to like why the f- do you want to join this crazy society hunting these things down? So you're not you're never left. You're not supposed to be ever left with the I don't know why my PC's here. I wouldn't. I you know yeah. I, w- I, w- I go back to the hotel. You shouldn't have any of that because of what's on your sheet. Even though what's on your sheet doesn't have a die value, doesn't have a rating. It's just a statement that you've made, which should result in some great like grounding of who you're playing and how you react with the world and that kind of thing. 
This chapter provides a historical background to the Society, an organization made up of people with the site that for centuries devoted itself to studying and banishing Vaesen, before it ceased to exist roughly 10 years ago. It also explains how you and the other player characters band together to breathe new life into the organization and reopen the Society's old headquarters, an abandoned castle in the Swedish city of Uppsala. The chapter concludes with a description of how you can explore unknown parts of the headquarters and work to improve it. I think the castle is so integral to the campaign and how you construct the castle and how you watch it evolve, not only in your own mind as the as the GM, but then the choices the players are making as they expand upon the rooms and what they can do in it. That's so huge. So it's such a it's such a key part of the game. The home base up it upgrades the same way that your characters do. So you get XP and you spend XP and you unlock rooms like the armory, the butterfly house, the carp pond, the infirmary, the kennel, the library. All these have some little mechanical benefit, many of which are actually when you're heading to the mystery. You can like some of them let you train two advantages instead of one advantage type of thing when you're getting into the field. Guys, there I forgot there are lists of threats to the castle in the book which say oh, yeah. all these things might happen when you're off gallivanting. Guess what's happening back home? In fact, when you build, the the points that you spent to build are used as dice to roll that's right. to see that's, that's what right. kind of bad stuff. And that's exactly what happened in that, in that story that I stole from Phil, uh, where they went, you know, they built a bunch of crap from the castle. They went off and had great, you know, had this adventure. They came home. Yay, we're ready to get home to the castle. And they're like reporters out in front of the castle. So as somebody who just stole this castle from a little old lady in a sane asylum, do you have any like <laughs> statements about that? Yeah. You know? And he's like, what? <laughs> so yeah. And that was because of, you know, a role after after building something with a castle. Yeah. You can, I mean, that's the the interlude is in the castle. Like you said, little subplots. I mean, if you yeah. wanted to, you can just simply mechanize the castle. Right. And it's just, it's giving you bonuses and the threats that come against the castle. Right. Sure. Right. You have to handle that, Yeah. Yeah. That helps the interludes too. Right. It's going to give something for the, the GM to bite into. This, when I read these chapters on the mystery generation and the, I was blown away, like, holy crap, it's just wall to wall. Great advice. And I think they call them Wayne central clues and peripheral clues. So the peripheral clues like help you understand like deeply what the hell's going on. The central clues move the story forward, get you into the next scene, let you know who's involved. But there's all this other like nuance, which may affect like if you're playing a campaign game, they can matter a lot, but you don't have to uncover them. Right. Um, right. And the so the pieces I wanted to mention before, uh, it gets into into deep detail around like what's the conflict primary and secondary like Wayne said primary is the vase in itself secondary is in every single adventure like which which groups of humans are pissed off at each other and are undermining each other or whatever so there's always at least two things going on in any given scenario some mysteries you're going to go off the journey is a big part of it some mysteries are just local the journey just or maybe it's even just a journey within Uppsala who who knows but yeah yeah for me personally, and I think for the author, I think Phil, you lean hard into the castle and the society and everything. I think the yeah. author in the first, the whole first part of the book is pretty clear about like this is about going to these wide, far flung parts of the of Scandinavia where it's strange when you get there and you have no backup mm -hmm. and you don't know anybody and people are looking at you sideways. That's like a core element of the game for me, at least. Thanks for checking out this video. I really appreciate it. Hopefully you've gotten some added insight and perspective into the game of ASIN. Obviously, it's a little bit of gushing over a particular tabletop role-playing game that we all have an appreciation for. But if you'd like to experience some of the details that we talked about, be sure to check down below where you can buy your own copy of ASIN. Uh, we'll have links to PDFs and print down below. I want to thank Free League and the team over there for putting something together that we can all experience and have fun with at the table. Thank you so much. And then I also want to thank my fellow contributors in the video, Harrigan, Phil, and Wayne, for giving us their insight and experiences to such a great tabletop RPG. Lastly, 
If you would be so kind, you want to check out Vason, but also check out Phil's mystery that he's actually published, and you can find that out on Drive Through RPG. We'll have a link that, to that down below as well. So thank you very much, and we'll catch you on the next one. See ya. This has been a Litterbox Studio production. production.